Um, good evening. Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Series. Tonight, it is our pleasure to present 50 years of the museum at FIT, Fashion as Cultural Heritage. Tonight, we welcome Professor Susan Scafidi, who's Director of Fashion Law Institute at Fordham University. Uh, Felicia Caponigri, an American lawyer and a PhD student at IMT School of Advanced Studies in Lucca, Italy, and our Director and Chief Curator, Dr. Valerie Steele. Please join me in welcome the, welcoming them. Thank you. Th is it? Yes, it's on. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd really like to thank Tanya Melendez and Faith Cooper especially for all the help they have provided in organizing this wonderful panel. I'd also like to thank you, the members of the public, who have showed up to the panel. Thank you so much. And of course, my panelists that I'm so honored to be on a panel with. We have, of course, Dr. Valerie Steele, director of the Museum at FIT, uh, and its chief curator has curated over 25 exhibits for the museum, including with Colleen Hill Exhibitionism, which is on display right now, a celebrated fashion historian who has contributed immensely to the fields of fashion studies and fashion, fashion history, and of course, Professor Susan Scafidi at uh, Fordham University School of Law, the founder of the Fashion Law Institute and uh, Fashion Law, who I think it is safe to say has really promoted the creativity and culture value of fashion throughout the world and has made the unique legal issues that are so prevalent in the fashion industry from sustainability to counterfeiting um, really part of a wider public discourse. So this topic today, fashion as cultural heritage, is one of, about which I am quite passionate about um, because I happen right now to be writing my PhD dissertation on how to protect modern and contemporary Italian fashion as cultural property. Um, as some of you may or may not know, Italy has a very long tradition of protecting objects uh, of historic or cultural um, interest as items of cultural property and as part of its wider cultural heritage. As part of this historic discourse, they are now really explicitly imagining how they might protect Italian fashion as part of their cultural heritage and also as part of that where and how to establish an Italian national uh, museum of fashion as well. So I come to this topic really from the Italian school, if you will. Um, as I'm sure many of us here can um, agree, or at least uh, all of us perhaps, fashion is cultural heritage. We might define fashion uh, cultural heritage very broadly as manifestations of human life, processes, traditions that we value, or as narrowly as objects of historic and artistic interest or national treasures. But what is really um, the next step is deciding how fashion is cultural heritage and cultural property. So the law, and especially countries that already regulate objects of historic and artistic interest as cultural property, give us some guidelines and questions to ask that are really part of the wider discourse. So for example, if we look at this image of a Roberto Cavalli uh, ensemble, which is also in the exhibitionism um, exhibit, we might ask, well, does it matter that Roberto Cavalli is still living? in order to consider this object an item of cultural property and cultural heritage? What about the fact that it was made in 2002? Does time matter? Uh, do we think that the embroidery is particularly of artistic interest? What about for dresses and objects of fashion like this Moschino dress, which I always love to show because the immaterial message, I had nothing to wear so I put on this expensive Moschino dress, really <laughs> <laughs> really has meaning because it is on a specific material, a dress made by Moschino. If put on another dress, the intangible message would arguably change. It would be more ironic. And then, of course, we get examples like the famous invisible sandal by Salvatore Ferragamo, designed and invented in 1947, but that really has at its heart an intangible process 
of creating this upper soul from nylon thread. And so then we ask, well, what's the relationship between the material and the immaterial? Can the specific shoe tell us something about which pro process Ferragamo decided to put in the shoe? So all of these questions that I've really named here happen and are mediated very much in the museum. And in fact, I would say that the museum at FIT, through its legacy, has really provided an excellent venue in which many of these decisions, you know, what part of the fashion object do we think is historically important, how do we communicate that to the public, are mediated. And today, with the tools of fashion law, I think we have a really unique opportunity to explicitly talk about and think about how fashion is cultural heritage, especially today when we're celebrating 50 years of the museum at FIT and in New York um, especially. So with that, I would turn it to a discussion um, between the two panelists and begin by asking um, Valerie, really, how do you think that the museum at FIT over its 50 years has changed in how it preserves fashion objects and really protects them, I would say, you, as you've said in other venues, for future generations. Well, if you look at this Adrian dress, um, our first director, Robert Riley, was planning an exhibition on Adrian, but there was no building yet. So instead of a museum exhibition, it was a live fashion show. And at that point in 1971, it wasn't considered absolutely horrible and unacceptable for living human beings to wear historic fashion and costume. So something like this, which had been worn by Garbo, was then happily worn by someone else who was an amateur fashion model for the show. And that obviously is no longer allowed. But it took a very long time. And even as late as the 1990s, you would find uh, some museums, even prestigious museums in Europe, that would show very important historic garments on living, on living human beings. And of course, earlier in the 50s and 60s, that was ubiquitous. I mean, Doris Langley Moore showed her beautiful dresses from the Museum of Fashion in Bath on people like Margot Fontaine and people whose waists were small enough to fit in Victorian dresses. I think I completely horrified you once, Valerie, before we knew one another well, because we were doing something in law that had to do with the use of trademarks on fashion. And do you remember Christian Fra Francis Roth had done the Crayola crayon-based yes. dresses? And I spoke with him, and he said, oh, I don't have one, but Valerie does in the museum. She'll let you wear it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it went on for I did not. <laughs> yeah. Designers still find this very, very hard and will sometimes ask if they can borrow things back so they can lend it to somebody. Their own archives are much more porous that way. You see things, wonderful dresses going out and being worn at parties. Right, I mean, there is, in a sense, this, this desire now to, for fashion houses and fashion brands to really create their own archives, yes. too. So how do you, as the director of the Museum of IT, and also, Susan, you, as you know, the head of the Fashion Law Institute, who interact with brands and help them with their legal protections, how do you both see this, both this founding of fashion brand archives, but also how does it affect what goes on in the museum and then the legal aspect of it as well? Well, it fits in with a long history of individuals and institutions having collections of dress. It's not just museums, it's things like wax museums, Madame Tussaud would collect dress worn by famous people. People often kept the clothing of their illustrious ancestors, or they'd save relics from famous people. You know, this shoe was worn by Marie Antoinette. So, but it took most fashion houses a long time before they realized that there was a kind of cultural capital embedded in the garments. And I think that's really how they thought of it. Not really in terms yet of heritage, but that there was, it was worth something to save these. And you could go in and then, copy them or be inspired by them or lend them to movie stars to wear at openings. And so gradually, I think first in Europe and much later in the US, people started to put together these collections, often in a very ad hoc way. I mean, I remember going to some collections, archive collections that shall remain unnamed that were really kind of sort of on wire coat hangers and still in paper bags from the last time they'd been taken out to a party and sort of strewn all around a crowded room that that was the archive. Later, of course, um, the, the 
companies got very handsome men in white coats to be the conservators and had these very elaborate things. If you went to the, uh, the Yves Saint Laurent Museum, formerly Foundation, it was a very elaborate museum-like situation. I think that uh, in the U.S., we've been uh, fashion houses have been a little slower to Much. embrace archiving, yes. in part because uh, fashion designs themselves have very little intellectual property protection, and because culturally, and this actually goes back to something that Valerie wrote years ago, culturally is of less importance in the United States. Yeah. So as fashion houses are now turning to creating archives, creating museums of their own, and, and, and that sort of thing, the law enters in. In, in, in some ways in, in, in that it's influencing those decisions, but also in a very nuts and bolts way, uh, having to do with nonprofit law and tax breaks. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that's another aspect yes. of, of the whole question. But you know, if you all haven't read an article that is short, it won't take you very long, uh, that Valerie w wrote in, I want to say 1990, in the, uh, the journal Lingua Franca, which was a very short-lived, sort of light-hearted academic journal. The article is half a dozen pages. It's, it's a quick read, but it's called The F Word, <laughs> and it's about the, la the lack of respect that fashion gets, it, the, the frivolity of fashion uh, that, that, that a as it appears in U.S. culture. And it's really become a touchstone for a lot of the conversations that we have on the legal side, unbeknownst to Valerie, right? Um, about what it means for fashion to have so little respect historically as a cultural medium and an artistic medium in the US and, and what the effects of that are legally. Well, I certainly had experience with American designers who donated lots of things to the museum at FIT to get big tax write-offs. And sometimes they just sweep through and dump everything, you know, the paper cups, the napkins, everything would go in with the clothes and big boxes. Um, and then once I got a phone call from another, an important American designer saying they wanted to donate to the museum at FIT. So just to be mean, I said, oh, money? And they said, uh, no, clothes. And I'm like, okay, how many were you thinking of? And they were like, about 400. And I said, I'll come over and look. I might take 10. Because they just wanted it for a big tax write-off. All of the schmatas they hadn't sold, they could now <laughs> donate and get a tax write-off. Exactly. I think that brings up the question too, Valerie, how do you decide what is historically or artistically important for fashion from the museum perspective, I mean for the museum collection? How do you, how do you decide that? It's completely different for every museum. So the Museum of the City of New York, what's important for them historically is things that were made or worn by New Yorkers. At the Smithsonian, it's much more kind of the clothing of the average man and woman in America at the museum at FIT, because it's a fashion museum, we're looking for things that are important for the history of fashion. And so things that advance the fashion discourse. And aesthetically, we want things to be high quality, but it doesn't have to be couture. Things that are uh, ready to wear by Jean-Paul Gaultier will be very important because it was influential. Or vernacular clothing, like blue jeans. We have a wonderful pair of blue jeans that was hand embroidered by the owner's girlfriend in the 1960s. We had a French TV crew over and they were like, oh, this is amazing, we'd never have this in a French museum because you know it's not fashion. And I'm like, well, I think it is fashion. It's, it definitely inspired designers and manufacturers to make imitations of this kind of thing, even though it was originally workwear that was then altered by hand in a do-it-yourself fashion. I love that you, you pointed out that different institutions will view fashion differently. And in fact, probably everyone in the room will see something different when, how many of you have seen the exhibition ex exhibitionism exhibit, the exhibit of all exhibits across the way? Those of you who haven't need to run over as soon as you possibly can because it really is fantastic. And so when Valerie has looked back at and chosen these pieces of exhibits and when you all walk through, you'll each see something different. We can all appreciate the beauty. We can all appreciate the craftsmanship, we can all learn about the history, uh, but those of you who have legal backgrounds when you walk through with your legal goggles on, uh, will look. there are certain things that will absolutely glow or spark, kind of the way uh, investigators would spray a crime scene with luminol to see those, those traces of blood, right? You, those, there are certain things that have 
very important legal significance in the in those collections, and we'll be able to talk about some of them as we go through. Right? Th certainly, the exhibit uh, "Faking It" that mm -hmm. is featured there um, on counterfeits uh, and 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 real and 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 originals, uh, but even things like the uh, the the pic the photograph uh, that we have in the slideshow of the Yves Saint Laurent Mondrian dress, right? that was based on the paintings from the 1920s, a suite of, pa of paintings uh, that he then turned into a dress uh, that has now been cited in an important copyright related opinion uh, because one of the things that museums help us do is decide what is and is not art. And, and in that case, we really have the line blurred as, as in actually the surrealism exhibit that yeah. is also featured as well and featured in the slides. Well, our first, our first director, Robert Riley, went over and met a lot of people, including Paul Poiret's widow, and he wrote to colleagues and said, oh, you know, your mother was a great buyer of couture. Can I come and look in your attic in your chateau in Normandy? And they'd, I read the letters and they'd write back, oh, oh, we don't have any of mommy's old clothes, but come and visit. And then he'd find these amazing Poirets, who's so important now for us. We think of him as being really a revolutionary designer, the man who, you know, supposedly took women out of corsets and put them into brassieres, et cetera, put them into you know, even trousers, Turkish trousers. But when he came home and told his staff at FIT, we're going to do a show about Paul Poiret, they said, who's that? Because he died in poverty and been forgotten. And it was only because of shows like this and research that people like Palmer White did, people realized, oh, he was a very important designer. So he then has historical value and it's not just sort of a miscellaneous odd costume that mommy had in the attic but it's something that's important. That's a, a perfect example of something that when I looked at it I thought well uh, how beautiful it's something from the Quarry exhibit but wow this is about women in the west moving into trousers and in fact when Amelia Bloomer back in the 1850s uh, first wore the Bloomer costume um, and, the, the, and the, the, the voluminous trousers uh, that, that that became associated with her name she called it the Turkish costume. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and then there's the additional more recent overlay of something that is in the realm of law because when we think of law we think not only of black letter statutes and court rulings and regulations but we think of social norms and we think of rules that have to do with organizations so we have levels of norms and rules and actual laws and our norms with regard to dressing in costumes from uh, and, and I think that's identified as a yeah. fancy dress costume yes. Persian inspired fancy dress costume are now changing uh, and so that's that also uh, just glowed with legal importance to me when I saw that piece. Yes. I, I think you bring up a good point, Susan, also about you know the facets of tangibility and intangibility mm -hmm. that yes. are common to both the definition of cultural heritage and fashion, yes. of course. So when we think about a work, uh, a costume, for example, being worn multiple times or being reinterpreted, the question that comes to mind is, well, what is of cultural value in that object? Is it what can travel or is it what remains you know, in the material object itself? And I know, for example, Valerie, that you, as part of the museum, interact a lot with fashion students, obviously, mm -hmm. because the museum is part of FIT. And one of the things that I most recently heard you mention on, on the Fashion Culture Podcast, I encourage everyone to, read, to <laughs> listen to it, um, is how, in fact, students are encouraged now, master students, to look at historical objects in the archive and make their own versions both to learn about the process, but also then to add their own, as so many creative directors today do. Mm -hmm, exactly. So when you think about this whole process and you know, protecting, wanting to protect the cultural value or historic value, and also, however, wanting to recognize the additions that fashion students make today, I mean, how do you think about this from the legal end and also the fashion historian end? Well, I think, I think in terms of creation, nothing is created out of out of nothingness. It's always drawing on the past, and designers always learn from the past how literally they follow it and to what credit they give varies a lot. We all know that it's very common for designers to just copy stuff and hope nobody will notice. And nowadays, increasingly, people notice. Because See also Diet Prada. Right, exactly. But then a few weeks ago, we had Rick Owens, who announced publicly, I was totally inspired by Charles James, and I've deliberately used the patterns in this new book to copy some of his looks, and I'll have several coats in the collection, which are Charles James coats 
as done by me in a different material, but that was really impressive. And it was kind of quite fabulous to see someone saying, I can really learn from this. That is wonderful. And, and that kind of inspiration is something that we always hope to see in every field. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton is credited with a marvelous remark. He said, if I've seen further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. He actually stole that quote from a guy <laughs> named Dionysius Exiguus, right? a monk in the sixth century. So he's sort of humble in that mm. regard. But absolutely, right? We, we always want to make the distinction between slavish copying that doesn't really advance yes. the craft uh, uh, or the art. Uh, and inspiration that does. And when the inspiration does and moves it along, it's so exciting because it makes you see the original in a new way because it's been, been perceived and altered. But most of the time it's just kind of sad. Uh, I've talked with dealers who said they sold things to designers and then they could see, oh yes, that's the pair of pants that he copied exactly. Uh, that, that is very sad, agreed. Now, do you think that the unique location of New York has something specific to add to this conversation? Because, you know, I, I think, for example, of the fact that FIT was founded in, by two members of the garment industry and that the fact that FIT is, in fact, still such a resource for fashion students is so important, both for its mission and the you know, fashion line to being in New York, of course, I mean, what, what do you think is so unique about this city and the location and the geography that informs both the collection and then also you know, the way, um, you've mentioned, Susan, how you know, fashion may be undervalued culturally in the United States, but I mean, how, how do you think that New York maybe plays a role in, in that or, or not? Well, FIT was, was created in 1944 explicitly to create a kind of MIT for fashion students so that they could learn by looking at the best of fashions and clothing from the past and create something new and also something distinctively American. So that this became really important because of course in 44 Paris was occupied by the Nazis and so it was cut off. But already for several decades prior to that, New York fashion educators have been saying, well, let's look at our own heritage, which they interpreted in terms of Native Americans and Inuits, et cetera, our own heritage, which we can pillage from, um, rather than just copying Paris. But at that time, they saw no problem at all with, say, copying from Chinese or, or other groups. That was just free to take. You know, I think that New York, New York is, uh, of course, one of the central hubs of fashion. Fashion is universal. The vast majority of people in the world actually wear clothes every day, and that's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, but, but the industry comes together in nodes and hubs, and there's a great book by a woman named Elizabeth Curid that you wouldn't necessarily know is about fashion because it's called The Warhol Economy. Mm. But it's about how, it, the, in a place like New York, create people bump into each other, quite literally, or get squashed together on the subway, quite literally. Uh, but the, the, the fact of different kinds of creative industries, the theater and, and the fashion industry and other related industries, uh, overlapping and borrowing from another is part of what generates the excitement and generates the creativity. So when you walk around New York, you'll see that fashion is literally inscribed on its face. From ghost signs and old inscriptions on buildings that were once factories, uh, to places like the Garment District uh, uh, that was created via a combination of tax incentives to push garment manufacturing away from uh, the, uh, the more elegant parts of town uh, over into what was not a very reputable part of town at the time uh, to the zoning regulations that maintained it as we started to lose manufacturing. Uh, so, and, and FIT, of course, anchors that fashion community here in, in New York with its very placement at 27th and 7th here. Uh, so that's an important thing to remember. Uh, but beyond that, of course, New York and, and many of the other fashion capitals are important political hubs and places where cultural change happens. And so things that we see in, again, uh, past a, a, a FIT exhibits, like queer history, and one of the sides that we have is a t-shirt that says, read my lips, and shows two men kissing. 
was what was actually advocating illegal activity at the time, right? A t-shirt from 1990 when many states had anti-sodomy laws, when the idea of marriage equality wasn't even a twinkle in the eye of the legal profession or the gay community. Um, so we, we see the wearing of fashion and the development of fashion at, in places that are particularly progressive, like New York, uh, being part of driving the conversation forward. Similarly, actually, from that same exhibit, and you could see it across the street, is the Yves Saint Laurent pinstriped trouser suit. Now, for, for us in the legal profession, a pinstriped trouser suit is basically lawyer drag or lawyer camo. <laughs> right? We wear those all the time. But in the 1960s, when Yves Saint Laurent was putting women in trousers, that was illegal in Paris. Um, in fact, it, it remained illegal in France up until 2013 when yeah. they realized they should take that law off the books, <laughs> but quite progressive. So places like New York and other fashion capitals not, uh, and, the, and the fashion created there uh, drive the law forward in some very interesting ways. Well, it drives fashion creation forward too, just like it drives artistic creation of all sorts. Um, studies of creativity always emphasize that the diversity that you find in certain big cities is conducive to a more creative atmosphere. Because if everybody's the same, then it's a kind of group think. But if you have different groups coming in, immigrants and minorities of various kind, whether sexual or ethnic, they think differently. And in conversation, in working together, they'll come up with different ideas. And so that's, I think, another under, under thought of a reason why cities like New York and Paris and London have been so important because they've had such a mixture of waves of people coming in, you know, whether they're coming in from Brittany and North Africa or coming in from China and Eastern Europe, they're coming in with different ways of seeing and thinking and dressing, and that leads to different ideas about what to wear and how to make it. I think your black fashion designers exhibit was a beautiful example of that, where you looked at lots of different designers, who, mostly American designers, but of, who were part of the African diaspora, and showed the, the, the vast range of the things they did, but nevertheless drawing upon their heritage. And so this question of diversity is something that we write into law, uh, that, that companies and, and organizations follow sometimes more reluctantly than they should. Uh, but but that fashion has illustrated can be a huge benefit. And so we're seeing actually follow-ons to that just in the last few years. The New York City Com uh, uh, Commission on Human Rights has issued interpretations uh, with regard to uh, gendered clothing um, and said that it is no longer legal in, in New York City to require a uniform, uh, to, uh, to require an employee to wear a uniform that is of a specific gender. Uh, it, you can propose uniform pieces that are traditionally female or male, but if your male employee wants to wear the skirt, that's just fine. And just recently, uh, they banned diversity, uh, excuse me, they banned discrimination on the basis of hairstyle. Yes. Uh, so another thing that the fashion industry pioneered and embraced, um, and, and that we've seen here, uh, that the law is finally following. Well, usually what you find too is when there are these distinctions, I remember studying police uniforms, and as late as the 1960s, police women in most states in the United States had to wear skirts and high heels and these stupid little hats that were pinned on. <laughs> and they had to carry their gun in a purse, not a holster. <laughs> and, and the gun had to be two inches smaller than a man's gun. And so it was only when you know federal law was changed and said you really can't discriminate, they have to be able to wear the same kind of clothes. And one policewoman who later became a captain in Virginia said, do you know how hard it was to chase the perpetrator wearing high heels and a skirt, you know, with the hat falling off the purse? The whole thing was a nightmare. Exactly, and the fashion industry could have told them that a lot earlier. No, I mean, I think this point you make about diversity is also very important, and we've seen it translate to Italy, too. For example, with the recent, you know, Gucci example, and there was a great article in the New York Times talking about how they're really urging, you know, companies in Italy, and I think Prada too has been one that it has is talking about, you know, diversity. So in this sense, we've talked about how American fashion may be undervalued in a sense culturally, but I think in many ways it has a lot to show and to teach the yes. rest of the fashion world because we do come from a culture that is so diverse and you see cultures today 
like Italy, really grappling with a lot of outside diversity, whereas maybe they've always been very regionally diverse. We think of you know, northern and southern Italy, as Susan and I were talking about earlier. Um, but you know, really this outside diversity and having to grapple with that and be inclusive um, in that sense. So speaking on the sense too, I just saw, I mean recently rather, that Ralph Lauren celebrated his 50th anniversary. So do you think that you know, now that really we're having these I would say milestones in American fashion. You know what? What does that mean? What might that hold for the future? I think that's a wonderful question, right? You you asked about the, the number fifty, and I'd really love to hear from Valerie, right? Because you've had several exhibitions around fifty. 50 this is the CFDA's fiftieth, and right. now your fiftieth, and it's it's a bit of a magic number, a semi-centennial uh, in in, in well, fashion. It's a golden, it seems. golden anniversary, yeah. Um, well. For one thing, it proves you've been around for a long time. And that, as we know in fashion, is already a big success story because it's such an incredibly competitive business that most companies, oh, you can't imagine how many super talented young designers I've met over the years whose companies only lasted a few years. Ten is a milestone yeah. anymore yes, uh, for, exactly. for many of those young ones. You know, when I thought about it, I thought, you know, in, in law, we have magic numbers, some of them you're familiar with. You turn 18 and reach the age of majority in the US, you turn 21 and can finally throw out that fake idea and get a drink. Um, <laughs> 50 is not usually one of our magic numbers, except in uh, one special area uh, that is very relevant to fashion, and that is the global minimum standard for every country that is a member of the World Trade Organization, and that's most of them. The global minimum standard for copyright protection for artistic and literary works mm -hmm. is life of the author plus 50 years. Now in the US, we've made that life plus 70. We added a few yeah, following Europe, making it life plus 70. But that's still the global minimum. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it tells us what actually is lacking in terms of protection for fashion designs. Uh, because fashion designs have a little bit of copyright protection, fabric prints, the two-dimensional aspects of fashion. Uh, but when we think about a three-dimensional design, it gets no protection in the US in the vast majority of cases. And so what have we taken away from, uh, from fashion? Or what do we refuse to award fashion? Life plus 50. Uh, so, uh, so big numbers. So, it, so that, that number does have some significance for us as well. I think it's also interesting because you can have potentially an overlap between what we might consider as cultural heritage protection and copyright too. Mm. So you can have an overlap between you know life of the author plus 50 or 70 years and then, for example, Italy says that a cultural property object, not fashion now, but we might talk about, you know, um, any other sort of painting. And of course, with modern artists, mm -hmm. this is becoming a real question, is, you know, a non-living author, but plus 70 years in the majority of circumstances for the thing. And so you have this really overlap of protection, almost. And I always think of it in a way as, you know, the author that is creating a type of cultural value during their life, and maybe then that continues after their life, but then at a certain point that cultural value may shift into a value that we may assign, we may associate with cultural heritage or cultural property protection. And I'm wondering how you both think about that evolution, if you will, of cultural value. So this idea that a fashion student or a designer really starts to put in their cultural value, and then that the cultural value is then taken by the community and reinterpreted and reascribed. Well, I think one problem that some people in the fashion industry have with the idea of protecting fashion designs is that I would always worry that the wealthy and powerful designers would say, well, I was the first one who did that, and then they would sort of be able to prevent other people from using the same sleeve, even if a fashion historian was able to show, well, that sleeve pre preceded the important rich designer. Um, it seems to me that what most younger designers need in terms of protection is protection for a year or two while, that's, while that look is trendy, because that's when the big fast fashion companies swoop in and copy it and take all of the money away from the young designer who's invested in creating it. Not 50 or 70 years later, but right at that moment is when it needs greatest protection. 
I, I agree with you, actually. Our proposal, we spent a long time in Congress actually trying to, trying to convince the US Congress between 2006 and, and 2012 to do that, and the proposal was three years, which yeah. would have made See, that would be sense. perfect. That mm -hmm. would really protect the young designers' investment in thinking up and creating and figuring out the best way to do that design without having it copied by copyists right away, who then, often because they can get the thing in the store sooner, they make all of the profit from it. Absolutely. But Felicia's question about the layers uh, w when we think about a, a fashion, a, a piece of fashion or a fashion object um, are, are interesting, right? Because we need to think about uh, protecting the physical object. Mm. But, and then when we talk about intellectual property protection, we're protecting the design that can be abstracted and repeated. And then beyond that, we're thinking about the cultural emanation of the, that results from the wearing of, of that object yes. by an individual or, or by many individuals um, uh, and the development of a style or a trend. So there are lots of levels that we, at which we can think about that. And actually, you, you've heard Felicia several times say cultural heritage or cultural property right. or to use the yeah. two interchangeably. And we should maybe break that down just a little bit. I think that would be great. Would you like um, to do that? Susan? Sure. It, it Basically, uh, everybody but lawyers uses the phrase cultural heritage. Anthropology Psychologists, historians, yeah. people in the cultural studies realm. Uh, when, when, when it comes to law, we usually say cultural property because you know, we're material yes. girls. Uh, if we say yes. property, we can talk about ownership yes. and we can start applying rules and regulations. But this whole area, very just briefly, actually grew out of uh, the law of war. Uh, there was a guy named Lieber, a professor at Columbia during the Civil War, who said, you know, uh, we should have some ethical rules for waging war and we shouldn't attack things like hospitals and libraries and museums. Mm -hmm. And that idea started to spread globally. And after World War II, uh, there was a convention that a lot of countries signed on to, not the US, but we acknowledge its principles. <laughs> at the Hague Convention, 1954, that basically said, let's stop bombing important things like the Abbey at Monte Cassino, and let's not target m museums and other cultural institutions. It wasn't until the 1960s and then cul cul culminating in a, uh, a convention that was signed or, or ratified uh, in, in 1970, UNESCO, uh, the UNESCO Convention, uh, that we started talking about trafficking in cultural items, right? And we started to say, okay, not bombing them is good, uh, but when, we, when we're dealing with uh, raids uh, uh, to, and, and uh, of e uh, archaeological sites, and we're dealing with theft of cultural items, um, then we need to actually put some rules in place around that. Fast forward to 1995, and the Unidwa Convention starts to add some teeth to this idea of limiting trafficking in cultural items uh, and creates a list of things that it considers cultural items. It's a long annex. Um, it has artistic items. It has items of paleontological interest. It even lists some specific things like uh, furniture and musical instruments. It does not list fashion, however, unfortunately. And not until this millennium in 2006 do we get a convention that says, oh, by the way, there's also intangible cultural property. That is to say, there are things that are created by communities, cuisine, dance, dress, music, mm -hmm. folklore, traditional medicine, that might also be deserving of yeah. protection. So, so, th so that's the area in which we're playing when we're thinking about regulating it. Of course, all of those international conventions are soft law in a sense, right? They are, they're, they're public international law, they're principles to which we aspire that are not necessarily inscribed into the kind of law that we can enforce easily. Especially since I would think very often it's a question of power. If Absolutely. one group takes over, like say the French took over Brittany, then they said you can't speak Breton, you can't wear those clothes, you can't sing those Breton songs, you have to be a French person now and do it all in French and wear Parisian fashion. And so that kind of thing means that the powerless are stripped from of an aspect of their culture. That is absolutely the case, and that's one of the most difficult things to think about when we when we start talking about protecting local cultural products, indigenous peoples and their cultural products, whether they're from Brittany or uh, from uh, from Arizona, uh, and 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 because there is that historic powerlessness and that and that imbalance, we're having to start to rethink 
about how we borrow and in what context we borrow, or when we refuse to protect and actually suppress. Yes. Well, I mean, you have a whole long history of Christian missionaries or Islamic Absolutely. missionaries coming in and saying, we don't like cover the way you guys up. are not dressing. You have to cover up. Yeah. Exactly. And I would add to your description of the international also that there are national regimes that purport to decide what is cultural property and whether it's tangible or intangible. So in the United States, for example, in fact, New York is a great example of this for landmarks. New York has, ever since the 1960s, has been so proud of protecting what we might term immovable objects, so large buildings. Um, and then at the federal level, with the National Historic Preservation Act, we have decided to really protect immovable objects that are of significance for the American history. But we haven't really, except for maybe some instances with you know the New York Arts and Culture Law and the California Law, decided to protect movable objects, so Absolutely. paintings. And that's another aspect to, to talk about, the fact that fashion really is in a gap in so many ways, not just in terms of tangible and intangible, but also in terms of physicalness and permanence. Mm -hmm. So fashion is ephemeral. It's Yes, but I mean, certainly within the context of fashion in a museum collection, the argument that museums that have fashion collections use is that it may not last forever, but you have to, it's being held by you in trust for future generations to help try and preserve it as long as you possibly can. Yes, it's true that eventually it may disintegrate, especially things made out of rubber and you know strange modern materials. But you won't do you won't put a Han Dynasty textile thumbtack to the wall with direct sunlight <laughs> on it which I saw at the Beijing National Museum, oh where you think, this has lasted since 200 BCE. It will be destroyed in less than 10 years. Yes. That's, that's absolutely terrible. You know, fashion benefits a little bit from the protection of physical places. I think there are two fashion-related items in New York on the National Register of Historic Places, and that it, uh, it's the building where the, that housed the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory and the terrible fire from 1911, and Macy's, <laughs> because it's a big, important department store and very early. Uh, but in general, uh, the problem with something like that is that most countries, including the US, would not step in to the, to the museum and say, stop that. You know, you need to protect that. They, al they allow for the creation of public and private institutions that voluntarily engage in that protection, right. as the museum at FIT does so beautifully and takes the leading role. But the government doesn't say, you, in, in the US, you can't export that, you can't destroy that, you must treat that with care. Right, and in that sense, I think museums like the Museum of Reverity step into perhaps a, a gap that exists because you do protect the collection and the fashion object for posterity. And in some senses, because we have museums that are so exemplary, we may not need, in that sense, talking about the, the material object now, to have specific rules. Maybe this negative space we have in the law is really there because museums and institutions step in to fill that, fill that gap. It, it's a perfect example of the fact that formal black letter law says really nothing other than to carve out a space and maybe grant some tax breaks, 501c3 status, but institutional rules uh, and regulations, which are law in their own way, fill that gap beautifully. Uh, hence, we're not going to be trying on anything over in Valerie's <laughs> archive. <laughs> so I think we're, we're about, yes. Do we have questions from the audience before, before we get to the last, the future? Oh, great. So, oh yes, the audience hinted actually on a question that I had wanted to ask Susan too. This is great. So, but I, this is for you too, Valerie. So, what do you think of cultural appropriation? And you know, when I think of this question too, I always think in the United States we talk a lot about cultural appropriation. I think also because as we were talking about, we're a very diverse culture. We're happily diverse. We give a lot to each other in terms of our traditions. And as a result, we, we speak about cultural appropriation, but we, maybe we don't speak about what we're protecting that we don't want to be culturally appropriated. We talk about sharing and cultural appropriation, but not necessarily about, you know, stop. That's the cultural heritage that we want to protect. 
So maybe, Susan, you could talk a little bit about the difference between cultural heritage, cultural appropriation, and then Valerie, if you have any comments. Absolutely. Well, how many of you are planning to go into academia or thinking about it? A few hands. All right, I have some advice, and that is be very careful about what you write early in your career. <laughs> um, in, in 2005, I published a book on cultural appropriation. And at that time, my mom read it and, and a few colleagues, and, but nobody really knew what it was. It wasn't part of our, of our cultural conversation, really, at that point. Um, and it was really in 2015 at Yale University, uh, just before Halloween, uh, when someone sent out a, a, a memo saying, let's be respectful in our, in our, co in our cosplay, in, in, our co in, our, in our wearing of costumes on Halloween. And someone else pushed back and said, don't we need space to play? And there, there resulted a, a, a series of demonstrations that spread across the country, that hit the newspapers, that it really became part of our common parlance. Uh, and unfortunately, having, having written a book about it, I started getting lots of calls uh, you know, about what is cultural appropriation and where do you draw the line. And so what I would say is cultural appropriation as a, an academic term started out as a descriptive term. That is to say, it was the taking without what I, what I would define it as is the taking without, and it hit the Oxford Dictionary this year, I think, it taking without permission of another culture's uh, artifacts or cultural products or intellectual products. Uh, and, and, and the question then becomes, when is that positive borrowing and sharing uh, and inspiration? And when is it, is it harmful misappropriation? And, and that line drawing is, is where we spend a lot of our time in the cultural appropriation conversation. And ultimately, there are some answers to that uh, that are part of a longer conversation for another day. But a large part of the answer to that is we need to ask the source community. What is sacred, secret, off limits? When are we copying? being too closely, we need to think about the nature of the source community uh, and whether it is a historically oppressed or discriminated against community or a majority culture. So a lot of things go into that conversation. The great thing about this moment in history is we can have that conversation across cultures and, and we're having it in not the best medium, often in social media, but at least in a way that we can reach one another and start looking at those issues. Yes, I mean, I think that's really key whether it's appropriation in a way which is demeaning or hostile or appreciation. And people go, well, you know, but I went to Dartmouth, for example, and all the old alums would say, well, why can't we go wahoo wah and wear like Indian headdresses? And I kept saying, because Native Americans have said repeatedly and over a long period of time that they find it deeply offensive to have drunken white guys wearing headdresses and shouting supposed war cries. It is not respectful. You can't, how can you say that this is respecting them and honoring them when repeatedly they said it's the reverse? So, I mean, that is kind of a clear case. Um, in other cases, it's, it's fuzzier. When they had the girl who wore a, a chipao, a changsam, to her uh, ho high school prom, and a lot of Chinese Americans said that's cultural appropriation, and many others, including many people from China, said, but she likes our dress, so why shouldn't she wear it? And then it kind of came and down to- By the way, to, she'll but, buy it from us. But it, was, yeah, but it was too short, it was slit too high, it wasn't sort of wearing it the right way, it was wearing it like a barmaid or something. So the nuances were sometimes important as well. So it's really kind of a case by case thing, because you can say, well, if I cook Chinese food and eat Chinese food, that's okay, but not if I wear Chinese clothes, especially since, the, the wonderful thing about the Chi Pao is it's not a traditional Chinese dress. It's a fabulous modern creation that modern Chinese women in cities like Shanghai invented in the 1920s based on Chinese men's robes, Manchu women's robes, and Western women's fashion. And so it was a brilliant modern hybrid, which doesn't change the argument about appropriating it, but just complicates the issue because cultures have been borrowing from each other and creating hybrids in food and fashion and everything else for centuries and indeed for millennia. Uh, 
I love that you highlighted that story about the Chief Hao in the exhibition, uh, but and also juxtaposed it against something else that's in the slideshow and also in the exhibition, and that is a flapper dress from Paris in the 1920s oh, okay. uh, that has uh, embroidery all over it of a seated image of the Buddha. Buddha. Yes. And that's something that if, if it were created now and sent down the runway would cause shockwaves, but in the 20s, who knew, yeah. right? And because there wasn't that ability to have a conversation across borders and boundaries. Uh, I love also that you brought up the Native American example because it's one of the only places, if not the only place, in US law that we've made an effort to regulate ownership of culture. It start, it, it, via the, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act was actually passed in the 1930s to, pr to protect collectors against knockoffs, but it was revised in 1990 and, and again in 2010 in order to protect native, native communities. And it's very limited. It's about the use of the words in Indian or Native American or tribal or similar, or the use of tribal names on products that could be uh, considered in the same categories as certain handicrafts, including fashion-related handicrafts, right. bags and, and, and shoes and belts and clothing and, and other things. And if you're not actually Native American, it is illegal to label your products as such. Um, so, so that's the one time that we've started moving into this area of trying to address cultural appropriation via law. And the reason why we do privilege that area is because we have a very very sad history in that regard. I think though that what's really interesting today is that even when you think of definitions that we may immediately accept in the United States like Italian or French, when you think of the fact that Gucci is owned by a conglomerate that is not necessarily Italian, and when you think about all the layers that go in now to the national identity of a brand, I think that makes cultural appropriation, if you will, an even more nuanced question because then you know you said meant talk to the source community well who would we say for example if we wanted if we wanted to say Gucci's works are cultural heritage cultural property and then a copying of them is a cultural appropriation well who's the source community are the people who wear Gucci the source community is it you know the designers in Italy is it the fashion conglomerate so even in a question of authorship i think this question becomes even more nuanced, perhaps. I think maybe we'll go back, though, to the idea of that there will be protected communities which have been historically oppressed. And although Italy has had a difficult history, difficult to nationalize, etc., I don't think you'd automatically say, unlike Native Americans or uh, people in Native people in Australia, that Italians per se deserve to have you know, things protected as being, you can't call this spaghetti if you're not making it in Italy. Hmm. No, that's, that's Especially since they point. got it from China. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shall debate that after the panel, Valerie. <laughs> that's a very long debate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we have another question from the audience, uh, which is about striking a balance, really. So you mentioned copyright protection uh, for fashion, Susan, and the question is, might, and I think this also goes back to the idea of, you know, protecting this maybe intangible creativity that ch can travel very easily. Might the expansion of US copyrights inhibit inspiration? How can we really strike a balance in fashion is the question. Well, you know, we already have copyright protection for jewelry. Uh, and so we, and for fabric prints. So we have decades of experience in how to create that balance. And somehow we, we're still getting new jewelry and new fabric prints. So the, the system does tend to work itself out in that way, uh, just as an exemplar. Uh, but these intellectual property in general, copyright, patent, trademark, also some smaller areas, is, is predicated on the idea that we do always need to have a balance, a balance of what is and should remain in the public domain uh, and, what, and, and a certain amount of protection that will continue to reward and incentivize creators. One of the ways that we, that we draw those lines or create those limits and that balance is via term and duration. Yeah. And so Valerie and I said, you know, and then we agree that if we were to institute fashion protection in the U.S., 
a short period would be very effective. A long period would probably not be necessary. And there are other ways that we can use nuance within the law uh, to create a, a, some kind of balance. Uh, so for example, when we were running to Congress and, and asking them to pass a bill, that, and, and the bill was revised several times, we had some exceptions in there. Independent creation is a, a general defense in copyright. If lightning strikes twice for two different creators, both of them can have independent protection. Neither is infringing the other. We also wrote in something unusual, a, a home sewing defense. Uh, so, uh, so a home sewing exception, rather. So that if you are a talented home seamstress and you wish to, to be inspired by the runway and create something for yourself or your family, please feel free. Uh, so there are ways to create balance via, via nuance in the law that, uh, that enables both creativity, uh, or that, that enables creativity con to continue and doesn't undermine the, uh, the R&D essentially that, that the, in which designers engage that allows a return on investment in, in financial terms um, while still allowing others to be inspired by what's gone before. I think nuance is very important. I, I think a lot of times, you know, when we think of the law, we think it's a hard and fast rule. And in fact, in the law, we have many standards. We have many ways of deciding. You know, we reason in court opinions. So often the law is an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. and decisions are. So it's, it's not maybe as black and white as you may first think. The other question was, please repeat the article in Lingua Franca by Valerie Steele. The title is the F word. The right? F word. The F, F word. word. N not, not the four letters itself, but the <laughs> words, <laughs> the F <Okay>. word. <laughs> so I get, oh, is there another question? Great. Wow. Thank you for being so participatory. Um, okay. So some would say that everything has been done regarding fashion, that nothing is new anymore. How do designers keep producing new collections but avoiding lawsuits? So in, in that's, yeah, that's a very, that's a good, that's a good point. That's the question. So, so fashion uh, in general uh, in the U.S. has little protection. It has almost full protection in Europe, uh, in Japan, in India, in Israel, in lots of other places. Uh, so so at, at one level in the U.S., uh, designers avoid lawsuits because there's simply no cause of action. That being said, we do have bits and pieces of protection for fashion. I mentioned jewelry. I mentioned fabric prints, the trademarks, the signs yeah. and symbols uh, that we all wear on the outside of our sneakers are all also protected. Um, and uh, then there's patent. Uh, and so if we have new inventions, new functional inventions, uh, we, we can protect those. And in fact, uh, we have the image of, uh, and, and in the exhibition, the Levi's jeans. Many of you probably have worn or owned Levi's jeans in the past. If you look at that little patch, uh, that leather patch on the back, and you look at the details, it's all trademarked. You've got two horses trying to tear apart a pair, pair of blue jeans unsuccessfully to demonstrate the strength. Uh, but you also have in the small print a note uh, that Levi's jeans had a patent that issued on May 20th, 1873, and the date is printed on the back of your jeans. And that patent was on the little copper rivets that were used to reinforce the stress points in the seams. And on that, that patent, on those little copper rivets, was built an empire, right? Uh, and so how do you avoid infringing? You get creative. Right? And, and you, you familiarize yourself with, as by, for example, doing a degree here, uh, but also observing the industry with what is already out there. And instead of slavishly copying, you continue to innovate, which is what the system is supposed to incentivize. And you try to avoid copying someone in France where they can sue you in France Absolutely. because you will lose that case. Yes, you will. <laughs> Should we name names? No. <laughs> no, never. Uh, so if there are, n if there are um, no longer any questions, I guess I would go to my last question, which has to do with the future. So I'm wondering how you see, Valerie, the future at the museum at FIT, maybe the next 50 years, what you see for it. And then, Susan, how you see the future of the fashion industry based on you know, everything we've talked about this evening, but also the role of museums and the law in shaping the evolution of the fashion industry, specifically, too, in the United States and New York, I would say. Well, I think museums have become 
increasingly professionalized, and so there are higher standards for what museums are supposed to do and what curators are supposed to know. I mean, the, the mission of museums is really like the mission of universities. It's the production and dissemination of knowledge, usually knowledge based on your core collection. So our mission would be to advance knowledge of fashion, but also in the process, especially because we're part of an educational institution, to educate and inspire diverse audiences with exhibitions and programs that advance knowledge of fashion. So um, what I'm seeing is with the younger curators, they're, they're just curators and other museum professionals. They're just more and more well-educated and have a much deeper body of, of knowledge about fashion and are very theoretically astute and come up with ideas that would never have occurred to me in a million years. So it's quite inspiring to me to see what they come up with. So uh, that's what, what I'm seeing is a really interesting young generation that's very engaged. I and mean, we just had a big symposium about exhibiting fashion that was um, really filled our larger auditorium and was uh, seen in 35 countries around the world and 35 states and, it was, and people, it was really great and showed there was tremendous interest among a lot of people to figure out about collecting and exhibiting and interpreting fashion. Oh, that, that is absolutely brilliant and congratulations on the exhibit but also on the symposium. It was uh, also quite international if I <coughs> must say. You had voices from you know, England, Italy, the United States were a great international dialogue too, and it's available to watch yes, again. Yes, it should too, be on so. again on soon now. Yes. So when I think of fashion, I think of fashion as functionally a form of communication or an information technology. And as I see fashion moving forward, I think, it, and I would love Valerie's thoughts on this as well, as well as Felicia's, I think it will become increasingly participatory. I think that the, uh, the idea of a couturier, couturier or couturier in Paris proposing something and it trickling down uh, to, to the rest of us uh, around the world is, uh, was for a good century probably the way it all worked, but I think now now there's a lot more give and take. Yeah. And I think museums are capturing uh, with really forward-looking exhibits what is going on in terms of that give and take. So one of the key themes in, in modern fashion today and, the, and one of the things that emerging designers are trying to do is create sustainable fashion. And so you had a couple of terrific exhibits, one on going green and another, hello again, on <laughs> recycled fashion, terrific, that are, that are also represented. Um, I think that that, that fashion has moved in that direction. The museum has captured and identified that. And oh, by the way, the law is following up by saying, wow, if fashion designers are claiming to be uh, sustainable or green, how can they do that without misleading the public? Mm. And, and so the Federal Trade, Federal Trade Commission issued a whole series of green guides with lots of fashion-related examples on what you can and can't claim. Uh, and so we'll see that sort of thing moving forward. Um, Another great example might be, ah, how we're dealing with influencers, going to that participatory question. Yeah. Yeah. Over across the way, back in the corner, you'll see an exhibit called Lucille, and it's, it's about designing the it girl. Uh, so back in the early 20th century, Lucille, or Lady Duff Gordon, if we were being formal, right, um, is, was an early influencer, and she was quite the scandalous figure. She and her husband escaped the Titanic uh, a disaster, and she launched a line of her own. Every first year law student knows her name because of some of the contractual issues she got, she, she managed to get herself into. I don't know how many first year design students know her name, uh, but that kind of exhibit telling us something about the history of influencers creating fashion lines is something that we are wrestling with today. And so uh, the, the same uh, federal entity, the Federal Trade Commission is asking itself and developing regulations on what influencers have to review reveal uh, when they're posting on Instagram. Uh, so so that, that kind of resource from the museum telling us what the history looks like. And we could go issue by issue, diversity, uh, body image and body shape, all of these things that are evolving cultural norms are captured uh, in, in institutions like Valerie's and, and like the museum at FIT at, at, at a point before they really enter the legal conversation 
education in a systematic way. And so that kind of partnership between the people creating fashion, the people wearing fashion, the people preserving the culture of fashion is extremely important to the regulation of fashion and the industry as well. Well, I, I completely agree with that. I think the, th the fact that museums spotlight the issues maybe before they enter the legal realm or concurrently really enables a great dialogue. I think as well, though, we're really going to have to grapple with this dichotomy that we insist on between the intangible and the tangible, or the material and the immaterial. And I think about that a lot because of Instagram, yes. because of the sharing of images, because of the use of images, and just also, you know, the seeking of permission to use yes. images yes. is a huge aspect that affects everyone. You know, all of us, when we post to our Instagram, museums, yes. designers, and so we're really going to have to grapple with, you know, what are we going to protect? Are we going to protect something that is intangible, something that is tangible, some in, in some way an intangible that is caught up in a tangible, yes. and what are we going to call it? Are we going to call it copyright, cultural heritage, cultural property, something else in intellectual property, you know, what are the terms we're going to assign to it? So maybe in another few years we can have a follow-up panel Good. and answer these questions. <laughs> in the meantime, we have all duly signed our releases for yes, the image of our images today. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much and thank, thank you, you. Susan.